We've always had an interest in UFOs and aliens, and spend many hours looking up to the skies in hopes of seeing something unexplainable. UFO and alien content, along with the paranormal, was at the forefront of the type of content we produced here on Top 5s when we first started. Five years ago, we then decided to start our second channel, Destination Declassified, to exclusively cover UFOs, aliens, and conspiracies. It's been a great creative outlet. However, we realize that many Top 5s viewers are missing out on the UFO and alien content. Therefore, we've decided to start uploading more of that type of content here. For the time being, we're still going to upload content on Destination Declassified, but more occasional documentary-style content, like the documentary on Roswell we're currently working on. So with that being said, here is a compilation of our top five insane UFO stories and encounters that we have uploaded to Destination Declassified recently. We hope you enjoy and are looking forward to more of this type of content here on Top Fives. As always, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. As ever, we must go back to the beginning to understand the facts, timeline, and location of the occurrence before making our minds up on what exactly happened. Fox Lake is a popular camping area close to the local highway and situated within the small, westernmost territory of Yukon in northern Canada. A favourite spot for boaters and canoeists alike, the sheltered bay and the south end of the lake is perfect for outdoor and water activities. The province of Yukon is no stranger to obscurity due to its remoteness and extremely cold weather during the winter months. As the lake is situated miles from any populated cities, Objects or lights that do not fit the normal criteria for everyday aerial mechanics are considered to be suspicious. The events that transpired on December 11th, 1996, between the hours of 8pm and 10pm, can certainly be described as such. According to more than 20 witnesses, a massive object with extremely bright lights hovered close to the region and passed over three separate areas across the Klondike Highway, racking up 130 miles in total before disappearing out of sight. It was unanimously agreed and reported that the size of the UFO was over a mile in diameter, bigger than a full-sized football stadium. Those who witnessed and subsequently described the colossal craft were separated and broken down into numbered groups to protect their anonymity. So, let us look at the first reported sighting, which was seen by six individuals, or Fox 1 to Fox 6. Around 8pm local time, somewhere along the Klondike Highway, Fox One was driving his car when he noticed a large, illuminating light in the distance, which seemed very much out of the ordinary. Guessing that his eyes were deceiving him, the man who cannot be named continued on his route when he noticed the same bright lights. This time, however, they seemed to be emitting from a long, smooth surface area. Fox One notes that his eyes were not deceiving him, and that he could in fact clearly see the rectangle light moving over a hill to the east. Trying to make sense of the oddity which had passed over his field of view, Fox One managed to readjust his sight to the nighttime conditions after being initially blinded by the brightness. Steadying his car and vision, the first witness was able to catch a glimpse of what seemed to be a large group of rectangular orbs dipping below a hill on the east side of the highway. Desperate to understand the entity, an exhilarating feeling forced him to head for the hills to try and get a better glimpse of what seemed to be a UFO. Canadian engineer and personal investigator of the Fox Lake incident, Martin Jasek, picks the story up not long after Fox 1 decided to veer off course in his attempt to see the object once more. Two of the witnesses were cousins driving in separate vehicles. Each saw it over the lake, slammed on their brakes and got out of their vehicles. The relatives known as Fox 2 and Fox 3 were indeed making their way northbound in separate cars from the city of Whitehorse to the small village of Carmax, when they spotted the craft up ahead in the distance. Running parallel to Fox Lake itself, the cousins were able to scan the frozen waters from their vantage points. Both men were approximately 600 meters apart. Jasek notes that at this point, they watched the huge object as it slowly drifted towards one of them and was soon almost directly overhead. The report states that Fox 2 was the person who stood in awe at the massive spacecraft, as he found himself directly below its powerful presence. Transfixed by what was happening, Fox 3 could do nothing but stare at his cousin, not knowing whether he was in danger 
or in some sort of psychedelic trance. Before long, the enormous body slowly moved away from the lake, heading further to the east and over another set of hills. As it disappeared, the men noticed the same smooth surface of the entity as the lights became less blinding. From here, Fox 4 and Fox 5 came upon the craft from the southern end of Fox Lake. Investigator Jasek confirms that at the same time, a married couple with their baby were a bit further to the south along the same highway. They too saw the object. By the time they caught up with the cousins and pulled over, the object had moved off. According to reports, the couple were able to see rows of lights, which were moving steadily across the frozen lake. As they had a two-year-old child in the back seat, and fearing for its safety, Fox 4 and Fox 5 picked up speed and drove as fast as they could before coming across the two cousins, who were still standing in absolute wonder and confusion. Pulling over to the side of the road, the young couple decided to ask the men what happened. None of them could conjure up an explanation. The small family continued on their journey towards Brayburn Lodge, where they asked the same question to the lodge's owner, Stephen Watson. Noticing the panic and bewildered faces of the couple, Steve tried to reassure them by saying, Oh, you must have seen what Fox One saw. Word was beginning to spread. A sixth and final witness of Fox Lake was reported to have seen the craft whilst driving in the nearby area. The lady, Fox Six, was unsure of the time of the occurrence, but can clearly recall the brightness of the lights that beamed from the ship, engulfing her car and lighting up its interior. Trying to see past the brilliance above her, Fox Six was able to distinguish a large illumination of multicolored lights projecting straight down towards her. The sheer magnitude of the intimidating object caused the car's light and music to slow down to an eventual stop. Of all the registered witnesses that we know of, Fox 6 was the last to see the UFO before it made its way towards Pelly Crossing. Between the last recorded sightings between 8.30pm and 9pm, the village of Pelly Crossing would receive its visit from the giant spaceship, which must have picked up speed, as the crossing itself is approximately two hours drive from Fox Lake. Similar to the witness testimonies given by the locals of Fox Lake, the Pelly Crossing residents would be attributed alias names. Pell 1 to Pell 7. Martin Jasek discloses the first encounter as It seemed to respond to a man's flashlight by accelerating towards it. When he turned off his flashlight, the object stopped. Pal 1, whose name was eventually revealed to be Don Trudeau, was on the northeastern side of Pelly Crossing when the large row of lights rose above the hills that had been shielding the village thus far. When the object stopped, it was just 300 meters away from the terrified man, who managed to get a good look at the monolith ship which loomed overhead. There was no sound coming from it, but he did report numerous light emissions and beams that projected in various directions. One even struck the ground near Trudeau himself. A green-colored beam shone horizontally out of the front of the shuttle, whilst two beams at the back seemed to slowly rotate in a horizontal position. Snapping out of his fixed gaze, Trudeau escaped from the ship's shadow and sprinted towards a small area of cover where he hid for a few moments before taking a deep breath and raising his head. The ship had disappeared. It was gone. When asked to describe and draw the aerial structure, Trudeau had only one statement to make. It was a UFO. Luckily for Don, escaping the craft's gaze and laser beams meant that he could continue living his life and provide us with more information as to how it operated. Was it attempting to abduct him or communicate via his flashlight? Perhaps we will find out one day. At this point, another two witnesses would reflect on their own encounter with the supposed UFO, PAL-2 and PAL-3. They noticed the object whilst entering Pally Crossing from the south side. According to the spectators, they followed a series of left-to-right moving rectangular lights, which led them to pull the car over in order to get a better view. The size of the spectacle was described in detail by the pair, and proved just how terrifyingly large the entity was, comparing it to the Big Dipper. Known also as the Plough, the largest asterism consists of seven bright stars in the galaxy, which have different meanings and mythological significance to numerous cultures worldwide. Comparing the size of the UFO to that of the Big Dipper provides us with an apocalyptic scene, 
much like the arrival of the spaceship in the 1996 blockbuster film Independence Day. The bright lights and lack of noise were also identified by the two witnesses, as well as a group of women who were taking a break from a satellite school lecture at Yukon College. Standing at the front desk of the school, PAL 4, 5, 6, and 7 noted the lengthy rows of brightly lit orbs that moved across the sky, silently and with eerie menace. As quickly as it came towards them, it vanished from sight over another set of hills and towards the north of Carmack's village. The Carmax is a village within Yukon, on the main river which also runs alongside the Klondike Highway, and is situated at the west end of the Robert Campbell Highway from Watson Lake. An extremely small village, it is also home to the Little Salmon and Carmax First Nation, a northern touchstone speaking settlement of people. The sighting itself consisted of nine witnesses in total, the first set of attestants, known as CRM 1, 2, 3, and 4, for the same anonymity purposes came upon the spectacle whilst driving near a landfill. Pulling over their pickup truck, the four men in question watched as the silent threat passed over the northeastern landscape before changing course and proceeding south. Before it vanished, one of the four men reported how the saucer-shaped craft swallowed up the sky by approximately 60 to 90 degrees. A family of five were the next set of onlookers to bear witness to the aerial phenomena. The mother and father, along with their three children, known as you guessed it, CRM 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, were watching television at home when it came into view. Just outside their window, the bright light slowly came into focus, beaming ever more brightly into their living room and filling the parents with terror. Thankfully, and with a little humor, the three children were under the impression that Christmas had come early and that the lights were in fact Santa Claus, along with his trusty herd of reindeers. Managing to compose themselves in light of this comical admission, the anxious parents peeked outside for another glance at the UFO. Again, it had disappeared without anyone noticing. Despite some radio announcements from the CBC North Channel, which reported a sighting across such areas as Dawson and Watson Lake, nothing more was recorded, and the cause was effectively closed. This is where our tale ends. In the weeks and months that followed, a subsequent investigation was opened by Martin Jasek, as well as other local UFO investigators. The witnesses themselves were relatively easy to locate due to the small population within Yukon and Fox Lake. As serious investigations have never been conducted by either government or military agencies, perhaps this tells us a lot about the obscure nature of the event and of a potential conspiracy. It's been noted that although many witnesses were happy to disclose their encounters with radio broadcasters and the investigators themselves, others had very little or nothing to say choosing to keep their anonymity as secret as possible. One official piece of information that can be highlighted as important to the inquiry is that the UFO has a Hynek classification rating of CE1. The scale, which was invented in 1972 by UFO researcher J. Allen Hynek, is a six-fold classification table relating to that of UFO sightings and in accordance with their proximity. CE-1 is classified as a close encounter of the first kind, a visual sighting of an unidentified flying object less than 500 feet in distance that shows an appreciable angular extension and considerable detail. For those who saw the ship in the sky that night, this attributing classification gives credence to their stories. As the spectacular arrangement of lights and unidentified craft was only seen by a limited few, not many alternative explanations have come to the fore. Some claim that the craft was an unknown magnetosphere phenomena, or a series of comets and asteroids, emitting distorted shadows in their wake. Most skeptics agree that it is most likely a spy plane or experimental government aircraft, which confused some of the witnesses who saw it. One theory which adds to the mystery has been circulating the internet for some time now, and relates to the ancient artworks within the region and outer areas of Fox Lake. The concept goes, that the Aboriginal communities in Canada handed down various scrolls, tablets, and spoke of extraterrestrial intelligence that regularly visited them from outer space, and who became known as the Star People. Some believe this visitation is not only a regular occurrence, but as a means for the aliens to make or continue contact and communications with their earthling brothers and sisters. With so many false narratives, pictures, and so-called footage of UFOs being posted online on a daily basis, 
it is often difficult to separate the fact from fiction. Some stories, though, blatantly false, can be appealing or entertaining in short doses. However, if one wishes to be serious on the study of extraterrestrials, alien intelligence, and the close encounter theorem, then we must narrow our search to the stories that matter the most. In the case of the Fox Lake incident, perhaps investigators, and skeptics alike, should return to the examination of such a massive event. Considering the amount of witnesses involved, their concurrent descriptions, illustrations, and official testimonies, as well as the oddly silent response from the local authorities at the time, leads one to believe that something has either not been found yet, or not being said. Not many people, even those who are born or reside in Scotland, may have heard of the Calvine. The small region is just off the A9 link road that connects the renowned highlands to the central belt and capital city, and is approximately 35 miles northwest of Perth. However, the story and the photographs that are now associated with the area will surely increase its tourism and affluence in the years to come. Considering how vital the following account is to the study of UFOs, and extraterrestrial activity worldwide. The uncovered picture itself is remarkable upon first viewing, yet the longer one looks at it, the more confusing and phenomenal it appears. Currently labelled the Calvine photograph, the image was taken along with five other snapshots on August 4th, 1990, and thanks to unrelenting research and investigative endeavours of UFO journalist Dr David Clark of Sheffield Hallam University, and UAP Media UK, has it now finally seen the light of day. An extremely large vessel is clearly seen in the still picture as it hovers above the ground, diamond-shaped and seemingly metallic in nature. It is said to have been approximately 30 meters in length and is concurrent with the stereotypical mechanics of the so-called flying saucer phenomenon. In the background of the spectacular image, a fighter plane can be seen as well. As it's in the distance, it is much smaller in size and scale to the mysterious diamond and was identified by the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Center, JARIC, who had access to all six photographs as a Royal Air Force Harrier jet fighter. What we don't know, however, was if the aeroplane was following the entity or not, or who the pilot is. Eerily, it has since been revealed that in October 2021, Scottish operations record books have no official listings or accounts of any aircraft which were due to take the skies on the day in question. In the hours and days following the photograph being taken, the original copies were handed over to the well-known popular newspaper, The Daily Record, who in turn provided them to RAF press officer, Craig Lindsay, who then passed them to the Ministry of Defense, due to their peculiar nature and aeronautical obscurity. From what we know, all original photographs and accompanying negatives were either stored or possibly destroyed by the MOD or the Daily Record, after their discussions and analysis. Thankfully, Mr. Lindsay had preserved the now-released image in his home after providing the authorities with the remaining snapshots of the UFO. Having been the first official correspondent to speak with the men who took the photographs, two catering chefs who decided to go for a walk that evening, Lindsay would conduct the interview and obtain the images that would not only stun the UFO community nowadays, but would take its toll on his own well-being for more than 30 years. Despite the initial excitement and mischievousness that engulfed him after he returned home with an incredible piece of evidence that clearly shows an unidentified flying object, Lindsay began to fear for his job and livelihood, as it could be said that he had broken protocol by keeping the photograph. Now in recent months, after Dr. David Clark managed to track him down to his home, and approach him for comment, Mr. Lindsay, now 83, would actually breathe a huge sigh of relief by saying, I had been waiting for someone to contact me about this for more than 30 years, and the burden had finally been lifted from his shoulders. So to whom do we give thanks with regards to the pursuit and eventual tracking of such an amazing piece of evidence? Dr. David Clark has worked as a curator at the National Archives in Britain, and is an Associate Professor of Media Arts and Communication at Sheffield Hallam University, teaching media law. He is a member of UAP Media UK, helping to uncover the truth about reports of anomalous craft. His instinctive ability for seeking the truth most likely stems from his previous journalistic work 
at the Sheffield Star and Yorkshire Post, as well as his position as a press officer in local government, which he worked at for approximately four years. More fascinatingly, Dr. Clark also has a PhD in folklore, which he completed in 1999 and was curator of the Ministry of Defence's UFO Files project with the National Archives from 2008 and 2013. Clark has also written and published books such as How UFOs Conquered the World, The History of a Modern Myth. Suffice to say, it would certainly appear that Dr. Clark knows what he is talking about, whose following testimony regarding the events of that evening in 1990 leave little room for dubiety. According to Clark's report in the Daily Mail on August 12th of 2022, the event occurred as follows. Almost 32 years ago to the day, on August 4th, two men decided to go for a walk in the hills after a long hard day from working at a nearby hotel in the town of Pitlockery, which is situated on the River Tummel, within the distance of Perth and Kinross. Both men had been working as chefs at the lodging and decided, after the kitchen had closed for the evening, that a drive to the Cairngorm National Park was worthwhile, that some fresh air was well deserved. They parked up their vehicle just before 9pm in the region of Calvine, along the A9, and began their trek across the mountainous terrain. It wasn't long before both men came across the huge spectacle that hovered in the night sky. The massive metallic object was described as being approximately 100 feet or 30 meters in length, and remained silent as both men observed it with terror and awe. After a brief spell of hypnotic gazing, the chef decided to hide from the intimidating presence above them, and scrambled for a nearby wooded area. After reaching safety, they noticed a loud, screeching noise emitting from the sky. In the distance, an RAF jet fighter shot across the distant clouds, not knowing if the plane was aware of the unidentified spectre. It then circumnavigated from its route and headed back to briefly circle around the object before shooting off into the northern skies. It was at this moment that one of the men was able to grab his camera and capture a series of striking photographs of the craft, with the jet fighter in the background. Almost immediately after the picture was taken, as if the UFO had noticed the flash of the camera, it vanished out of sight, ascending into the clouds at a high rate of speed, leaving the men horrified and totally confused. And that wasn't it. As quickly as it was spotted, it disappeared, leaving no trace of itself behind. Only a lifetime of questions, cover-ups, and investigations from the likes of Dr. Clark. Not only were we now faced with the image of an unidentified flying object, the fact that a militarized jet was circling the area at the time, and is seen in the background, leads to even more questions. Indeed, during this time, the Cold War was still ongoing, and had not come to its final conclusion, so it was customary for aerial reconnaissance to continue in the skies above until the dust settled. Simultaneously to the conflict, conspiracies and gossip began to spread regarding top-secret missions, which were supposedly being conducted by the US government, more specifically, the Aurora concept. In 1990, the same year as the mysterious events that took place in Calvine, the Royal Air Force was consistently on standby to be deployed in the event that Soviet forces attempted a late retaliation strike on UK shores. As previously covered on Destination Declassified, the possibility that Aurora, a enticement covert craft capable of flying at supersonic speeds and purposefully built to oversee defense programs and spy missions, was part of the discussion in relation to Calvine. Some believe it was spotted in the now former RAF airfield, based in the small village of Makrahanish. However, defense ministers denied, in Parliament, that the US had been given permission to fly or land any mysterious stealth aircraft within UK airspace, spawning yet more conspiracy theories. And yet, the original photographs, which were possibly hidden away by the Ministry of Defence, were scrutinised by intelligent chiefs, and according to David Clark, sources claim it to be that of a top-secret US aerial project. Eventually, the MOD papers were officially declassified. However, the names of the two men who witnessed it, as well as Craig Lindsay, were removed from that file under data protection laws. The normal process of publicizing previously confidential materials is to do so after a period of 30 years. The photograph should have been released on January 1st, 2020, if this was indeed the case. Eerily, however, the MOD and the National Archives attempted to keep them under wraps, until 2076, 
due to privacy concerns, stating, there are no photographs contained in the file. The file itself states that the original negatives were returned to the Scottish Daily Record. Back to the here and now, Dr. David Clark attempted to seriously examine and analyze the picture with both Craig Lindsay and Andrew Robinson, a senior lecturer in photography at Sheffield Hallam University. All three men are in agreement that the image is legitimate. Clark kicked off the examination discussion by stating, if it is a hoax, then it's a highly elaborate one, involving expensive, sophisticated equipment and flying models, not at the disposal of two jobbing hotel chefs. Robinson supported the judgment by saying, my conclusion is that the object is definitely in front of the camera. That is, it's not a fake produced in post-production, and its placement within the scene appears to be approximately halfway between the foreground fence and the plane in the background. In October 2020, the Scottish Sun newspaper decided to conduct their own investigation by formally requesting details via the Freedom of Information Act from the National Archives by asking a set of questions. Question one was, did the MOD transfer the dossier to the National Archive? According to the response, which is filed under reference DEFE 24-1940, the record was confirmed as being transferred from the Ministry of Defence all good so far. Question two was, was it just the dossier, or were supplementary materials included, such as photographs? The National Archive contents relating to DEFE 24-1940 at the time of the request were locked until January 1st, 2076, and under specific instructions not to be released or discussed by top officials from the UK government. Question number three was, are these files marked as classified, or somehow FOIA exempt, and why? The response this time focused on the redactions that were made to the files within the open online version, such as names and addresses of witnesses and or employees. Question 4 was, is it normal for files to be delayed for 50 plus years? Have you, the person replying to the Scottish Sun's request, ever seen this happen? Interestingly, it is typical for materials, except under section 40-2, to be sealed off a lifetime of such subjects. This is assumed to be 100 years from the subject's date of birth. Question 5 was, is the Scottish Sun's claim that the National Archives are actively withholding these files accurate? If so, who gave you this right? The final response on this was that the only closed information within this specific subject and or files is personal information and is therefore exempt under S42 of the FOI Act. Rather vague, I'm sure you'll agree. Graham Rendell from UAP Media UK, a group dedicated to serious conversations with the British media and politicians on the discussion of unidentified aerial phenomena, which was formed in late 2020 by Rendell and three other UFO enthusiasts, states, We may not be any closer to knowing exactly what the object seen over Calvine in August 1990 was, or who it belonged to, but an important piece of the puzzle has dropped into place due to diligent research. Dan Zetterstrom, also from the group, added, The Calvine photograph stands as one of the biggest mysteries in UFO history. As always, the answers found raise even more questions. So what exactly happened that night in the summer of 1990? What did those men see, and what happened to them? Was it a top-secret mission that was stumbled upon by two individuals who were in the wrong place at the wrong time? Too many questions, yet so little answers. What we do know is that the image provided by ex-RAF press officer Craig Lindsay, and with steady acknowledgement filtering from governments across the Atlantic, we may in fact be getting closer to the truth regarding the great UFO debate. As we continue to make strides in the development of technology and intelligence gathering, we are able to uncover hidden truths and hold governments to account on matters of great importance. For years, there has been frustration and distraction through the dissection of grainy footage and bogus testimonies. However, there seems to be a change on the horizon. With the recent disclosure from the US government, broadcasting of videos and stories obtained by military officials, and funding for such projects at an all-time high, maybe we can finally answer the question and confirm that we are definitely not alone. For the majority of us who are interested in matters concerning UFOs and possible contact with extraterrestrials, 
The case that occurred in Medford is probably too historic for us to remember. The small town in question is located 45 miles south of the so-called Twin Cities, between Faribault and Oatana, and is directly off Interstate 35. Though it has a small population of approximately 1,000 people, it is reported that an average of 33,000 vehicles pass by or through Medford on a daily basis, which makes this case even more pertinent, as the mechanical craft seen in the sky that day is unlike anything the townsfolk had seen before. Medford, which is also 60 miles south of Minneapolis and home to the popular Twin Cities radio network, has never really been in the spotlight or considered newsworthy due to its mundane happenings and small town life. That is, as it was, until November 2nd, 1975. It all began around 9.30pm, where locals, travellers, and even law enforcement officials witnessed a large, mysterious object in the skies above their small community. The craft, though difficult to identify due to the nighttime darkness and disproportionate cloud cover, emanated flashes of light from an array of beacons which were apparently attached to its exterior. One of the first witnesses to see the structure was Janet Kay, a young teenager at the time. Being a senior at Medford High School, Janet had a keen interest in writing and journalism, and had recently become editor of the school's newspaper. As she sat at her desk, studying her homework, she happened to glance out at the window and spotted something that would not only become the story of the week, but would be reported in the news, in one way or another, in the months and years to follow. According to the inquisitive teenager, she recalled seeing what she described as a UFO coming down out of the sky, as it made its way slowly towards her. Transfixed by the aerial entity, Janet, alongside her brother Jerry and mother Helen, watched as it glided downwards and across the nighttime smog, before eventually vanishing out of sight. Mrs. K noted that it was about 700 feet from the house, and it disappeared behind one of the buildings towards the nearby football fields. The lights were the most prominent characteristics of the abnormal ship, which Helen also recounted to journalists as having flashed red, green, and white, whilst her son Jerry noticed smoke ejecting from the underside of its vessel. Not content with seeing the object just once, the family jumped in their car and decided to pursue the UFO in the hope of getting a better look at it. However, they were unable to get as close after coming upon a dead end on the road not long after setting off. Though unable to get near the spectre, they did see it one last time as it ascended back into the dull sky above, maneuvering itself easily over the nearby hillside before taking off towards the northeast of Medford. After the initial excitement and subsequent car chase, Janet was able to gather her thoughts and recount her feelings to reporters, stating, that it didn't frighten me when I looked out of the window and saw it. But afterwards, when I realized what I had seen was unexplainable, that's when it started to get scary. The Kay family were certainly not the only ones to witness the unidentified craft as it made its way across Medford. Local residents Donald and Leona Raftal were driving down Highway 3, just south of the interstate, and around the same time Janet Kay saw the supposed spaceship when they too noticed a flash of light in the distance. Initially, the couple assumed the luminous burst to be a bolt of lightning or helicopter and initially joked about the possibility of it being a UFO. As they continued on their journey towards the heart of the town, Mrs. Raftal noticed the object more clearly as it hovered in the sky, distributing a long beam of red-colored light from its core. The married couple's initial humor suddenly took a sinister turn as they realized that whatever it was, it wasn't a plane or helicopter. Mrs. Raftal confirmed that the object went over Hamel's pit and we decided to follow it. It appeared to be a couple of hundred feet up. My husband said he thought he saw smoke coming from it. An almost identical description, timeline, and tracking log that the Kay family described and noted during their experience with the flying object. And so, with the Raftal's testimony marrying up with the Kay family's encounter, local law enforcement were notified. However, this was not before a member of their own unit at the Medford Police Department had caught his own glimpse of the spacecraft. Officer Rufus Alexander had been dispatched to the west of the town due to complaints of individuals 
setting off flares into the sky and across the nearby housing estates. Yet he would find no evidence of such behaviours having taken place upon his arrival and inspection. According to the Awatona People's Press a few days after the event, it was recorded that Officer Alexander was making his way back to the station on County Road 12 at around 9.30pm when he noticed a group of cars parked up on the side of a nearby street. Pulling over to see what all the fuss was about, the officer was greeted with confusion and an ounce of fear on the part of the motorists when they diverted his gaze to the skies above. According to Alexander, it was moving northeasterly, and all of a sudden it seemed to stop and hang for some time, then it took off again. As well as consistently changing colour, he even admitted that even though he didn't believe in the supernatural or paranormal, the sighting left him baffled and unable to conjure up a decent explanation for his debriefing report later that evening on his return to the station. Interestingly, the police had already been made aware of mysterious lights in the sky a few days before the UFO made its broad appearance across the plains of Medford. A gentleman named Philip Keeler, who was a resident of Owatonna, called the Sheriff's Department on the evening of October 30th, where he described witnessing an apparition in the sky, including lights just east of the town. Concerned about the strange phenomenon and curious to find out if others had seen the same object, Mr. Keeler described the same narrative as that of the later witnesses. His report states that he initially thought it to be an aeroplane that was real low with the landing lights on. However, it then proceeded to grow larger in size and much brighter in color before disappearing behind the hills. The case was disregarded until the night in question, where Steely, County Deputy Sheriff Aldo Ud Paddle, who was also present and on duty at the time of the sighting, reviewed the situation in full. Deputy Ud Paddle, another non-believer, assumed that the sightings were nothing more than abnormally shaped stars or weather balloons of some sort. This theory was subsequently investigated by the local press and national weather services. No recorded weather balloons were reported as having set off in the town or nearby areas that night, especially due to the late hour and difficulties they would have faced whilst in mid-air. This coupled with the fact that at the time, such weather balloons did not emit the aforementioned light displays described by the townsfolk, and so this theory was scrapped. Investigations were therefore opened and a broad search of the town, its hillsides and desolate terrains began. One particular area of examination centered on the local high school football field, where the Kay family unfortunately lost track of the UFO. What was found left them surprised and confused, and has raised numerous questions ever since. Though it may not have been considered mind-blowing or downright terrifying, part of the field itself was noted as being extremely stained in a patchy brown colour that spanned approximately 13 square feet of its pitch. Thoughts immediately turned to the possibility that the mysterious craft had indeed landed on the grassy field and may have been the scene of an extraterrestrial visit from unknown entities and their technological flying machines. Enter Dr. J. Allen Hynek. As many of you may know, if you are a regular viewer of this channel or have a keen interest in UFOs, that Dr. Hynek was an American astronomer, professor, and ufologist who became famous for his formulaic scale in determining close encounters by alien intelligence. The various types of encounters range from 1 to 5 and are calculated using multiple aspects and characteristics in relation to such encounters. During his time at the Center for UFO Studies, or CUFOS, Dr. Hynek was called in by local officials to examine and offer his expert opinion on the curious case along with a small team of investigators and advisors, including those from the New Frontiers in Space Phenomenal Research, local radio, and even a professional photographer from Japan, Heiner got to work on his study at Medford. Samples of soil, grass, and dirt were exhumed and logged for testing by the lab technicians in Kansas, in the hope of finding some unknown chemical or physical trace of alien technology. Heat traces, livestock, and witnesses of the craft as well as local townsfolk who were not even aware of the situation, were questioned on the happenings of that evening. In the end, after taking into account the landscape, police reports, witness testimonies, and aerial recordings from the 2nd of November, 
Dr. Hynek's hypothesis was rather disappointing. Describing the incident as an in-between case, Hynek paired multiple witness testimonies with very little evidence presented, and considered the time of evening and weather conditions, classified the event as a close encounter of the first kind, nocturnal lights in the sky. The mediocre result of Hynek and his team was felt throughout the town and its inhabitants, who were hoping for something more exciting, or at least conclusive in their report. Hynek himself was also left frustrated at the time, as multiple resources had been wasted on what was expected to be a considerable case involving a small town with a big discovery. He stated that we are limited in funds, so we have to focus on the good cases, and let a host of in-betweens go. Even though the UFO professor was confident in his belief that unidentified phenomena and that of aliens do indeed exist, he was not afraid to undermine certain events or avert to skepticism on occurrences that he did not regard as research worthy. Unfortunately for Medford, this was one of those cases that didn't make the grade. And yet, despite this initial letdown, the strange events that occurred in this small Minnesota town would be thrust back into the spotlight a few months later, when it received a visit from none other than Captain Spock himself, actor Leonard Nimoy. Accompanied by a film crew and sketch artists from the TV series In Search Of, the actor brought a fresh approach and excitement to Medford and its people as they flocked to see the man in person. The show itself was broadcast on a weekly basis from 1977 to 1982, whose primary goal was to investigate and discuss all things paranormal and or unexplained. During their time in the region, filming took place within various outland areas and towns such as Mellon and Wisconsin, where a family had also witnessed a strange aircraft that had landed just outside of their house. The event, which took place a few months prior to the happenings in Medford, were included to complete the editing of the episode, which was hosted by Nimoy and presented both events in detail. The sketch artists were actually law enforcement employees and were recruited in an attempt to accurately represent the statements and data from the witnesses at the scene, especially Mrs. K and her young family. During the episode, interviewers sat down with the Ks to discuss the events that took place that evening, complete with B-roll footage of Mrs. K walking around the football field, where the discoloured patch of grass was still clearly visible. Final data from the soil analysis was also discussed, which did in fact detect some increased luminescence, and many have indicated exposure to that of high intense radiation. However, nothing was deemed conclusive or evidence of alien activity. The show was broadcast, and though entertaining, did not provide concrete definitions as to what the aircraft was, where it was heading, or the remnants of its visit upon the town. Perhaps it's worth having a look for yourselves and making up your own mind. It's safe to assume that in today's multifunctional, instantaneous world of technology, interplanetary space travel, and disclosed documents, the case for every UFO sighting is indeed worthy of investigation. In the case of the Medford incident, funding, entertainment, and limited evidence all contributed to a flyby visit to a town, which may or may not have been visited by alien intelligence and extraterrestrial beings. It may be the case and opinion of those who attended the scene of the sightings that nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but for those who looked up to the skies that evening, well, they tell a different story. We live in a time where opinions and criticisms are constantly being thrown around, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, or other platforms. Yet sometimes it's the discussions we have with normal people from small towns and quiet neighborhoods that are the ones worth listening to. What do you think? As ever on this channel, we must first look at the background and specifics of the case in question before delving into the intricacies and analytics of the video, as well as the fallout that came after. According to scripture, in the year 1000 BC, after conquering the vast region, King David declared Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish kingdom. Forty years later, his son Solomon would oversee the building of its first holy temple. Though the territory has been under the rule of various entities, in recent times the city is now run by the State of Israel and has been the focal point of numerous struggles and rivalries. In the early 20th century, Israel's Jerusalem territory, along with neighboring Palestine, 
fell into violent conflict over the city's national aspirations from each side, both Zionists and Palestinian Arabs. In the midst of these battles, the United Nations' failed attempt at a corpus separatum resulted in the First Arab-Israeli War in 1948 and culminated in Jerusalem's division into Israeli and Jordanian. Since this political and territorial rupture, the hostility and contention regarding the prominence of the city remains a monumental issue and controversial affair between Israel and Palestinian Arabs, who claim East Jerusalem, or Jordanian, to be the capital of a future Palestinian state. The city, as well as those who govern and reside within the land, have been the subject of numerous conspiracies over the years, mainly due to their religious beliefs and or allegiances and affiliates relating to global affairs. Some believe that the members of a Jewish elitist society were responsible for the coordinated assassination of JFK and Abraham Lincoln, which in turn gave rise to the French and Russian revolutions. Others, such as the Anti-Defamation League, believe that certain events, such as the September 11th attacks in New York City, as well as the AID's epidemic, and more recently COVID-19 pandemic, were all orchestrated by Jews and Zionists to wrestle power and control over specific people and industries. A document known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was an apparent manifesto, which seemingly documented a plan for total world domination by the Jewish hierarchy. This was eventually deemed as a hoax, but hasn't stopped the accusations from mounting. But the city of Jerusalem was once again, and quite literally, thrust back into the spotlight in 2011, when a video was posted online, which seemed to document a large, hypnotic, glowing orb as it hovered over Mount Zion. According to multiple witnesses, who anonymously uploaded the hypnotic scene from various angles and distances, claim that an unidentified flying object, complete with extraterrestrial intelligence, had in fact visited one of the most sacred areas in the world. On January 28, 2001, at approximately 1 a.m., a large glowing orb is filmed as it descends slowly from the skies above and down towards Mount Zion and the dome of the Rock Temple Mount. The mount is considered to be the holiest site in the Jewish faith and originally consisted of two separate temple structures, the first having been built by King Solomon in 957 BCE the second temple was erected after the initial destruction of the first in 516 BCE, but was subsequently destroyed by the Roman Empire in 70 CE. The significance of this area and supernatural intrigue is due to the traditions, teachings and beliefs by Orthodox Jewish members. The belief goes that within this region, a third and final temple will be constructed when the Messiah comes and is considered off limits for even the most respected of rabbis to walk across. And so, with this in mind, we watch as the white light slowly plummets towards this ancient, divine construct of Jewish faith and power. Oval-shaped and extremely bright, the object descends from the sky in a strange line before coming to an abrupt stop at the top of the dome, where it hovers for a short period of time. Voices of concern, disbelief and excitement can be heard from those filming the scene, as well as all those in the vicinity of the holy building, before suddenly, an extremely bright flash emits from the ball of light, blinding the spectators and camera devices before shooting back up into the sky at a rapid speed. From there, nothing else happens. As quickly as it appeared, it vanishes out of sight and up into the heavens above. Despite the initial buzz around this miraculous vision and a variety of video evidence documenting the magical event, many were quick to analyze and discuss the object from a non-biased perspective. Due to the speed, glow, and size of the object, it is certainly not a helicopter, drone, or lantern of some sort. The variance in speed and trajectory is unlike anything anyone has ever seen before. The orb is glowing too brightly to identify what lies behind its beams, nor can one assume its dimensions, technological apparatus, or structural mechanics. Many jump to the conclusion that light emissions and glowing orbs can easily be manipulated, especially from a distance to project a deliberately distorted vision of unidentifiable flying objects in the sky. Although the speed and upward trajectory is too fast for drones, the movement of the vehicle as it slowly drops from the sky, as well as its steady hovering above the dome, is definitely possible through the use of drones and CGI. The fact that none of the visual angles are close up, nor are they filmed with high-grade cell phone camera pixels, bearing in mind the date, 
skepticism is not unjust. The video itself is eerie on first viewing and managed to become front page news across the globe. However, if this was indeed evidence of the Messiah's return to Earth through an unidentified flying object or angelic light force, there would certainly have been more evidence and a monumentous religious and media fallout. As time has progressed, so has the ability to construct, record and manipulate images, video and sounds to our advantage. CGI can now be formed in the comfort of our own homes with affordable software and simple online applications, which for UFO enthusiasts and investigators is a nightmare to try and decipher. Though many hackers, online trolls and YouTube users remain anonymous to an extent, there is always a trail or hint of claim to documented events which have a credible validity. The fact that no one has come forward to lay claim to this apparent second coming, nor does the reaction of the blurry witnesses seen in the film seem genuine. This also gives credence to the hoax argument. Such a colossal piece of evidence would surely have been worth a fortune to mainstream media and publications from various entities. Why no one has identified themselves as the person behind the cameras is a mystery in itself. Another argument for the apparent fakery is that though there is external noise from the nearby crowds, there is no sound coming from the orb itself, and the primary reaction only seems to emit from the people recording the incident. It's reported that there are approximately 1 million plus people in Jerusalem at any given time, with thousands flocking to the sacred ground whereupon the dome resides, yet no one else seemed to react to the glowing UFO above them. Robert Schieffer, author of the Bad UFOs blog, spoke with Life's Little Mysteries podcast, stating, The effects of the video processing software are clearly seen. The hoaxer used motion tile effects with edge mirroring to introduce camera shake into the video. Schaefer, a longtime skeptic on all matters concerning UFOs, extraterrestrials, and the paranormal, continued his critique on the upload by stating, You can see the mirroring effect along the edge of the video. This proves that the video did not go directly from the camera to YouTube, that it made a stop in between inside a sophisticated video editing software suite. It was safe to say that the evidence was stacking up greatly in relation to the video's authenticity. Another final claim from the critics centered on what was said, rather than what was seen in the tape. At some point during the short clip, a woman can be heard saying that the brightness of the light's illumination was too great that you can almost hardly look at it. And yet the orb does not seem to reflect any light from the dome of the rock itself. For some this suggests, again, that the supposed UFO was digitally inputted to the scene, and the reaction from certain individuals within it is falsified for dramatic purposes. With such a backlash from UFO investigators and skeptics alike, there was little room to argue in its favour, despite the attraction of the media and online platforms. It is at this point that conspiracy theorists or strong believers in the faith can make their own assertions on the UFO's validity and purpose. As we have covered previously on this channel, those who tend to question the government or elitist groups that are said to control the world, as well as its political, social and information industries, tend to go missing or completely change their stance on certain topics. Groups such as the so-called Illuminati and commonly known men in black are casually discussed in jest as to their role in our planet's conditioning, as well as interplanetary relations, but hasn't stopped theorists from believing in a more sinister agenda Perhaps this is the reason that those recording the incident did not want to come forward, had they gone missing or become silenced by these ominous entities before they could fully explain what they saw and recorded. The belief and possibility of alien intelligence is a topic which is paramount to this channel, and so one must surely ask themselves the question, what if it was real? Although there is much evidence to the contrary, to believe that aliens had in fact visited the city of Jerusalem that evening, and had managed to manipulate the recording and subsequent narrative from those involved in the aftermath, which is not beyond the realms of possibility. Many will already know the story that we have covered on this channel in the past of Dr. Herbert Hopkins, who received a visit from a mysterious character at his home in September 1976. Dr. Hopkins' study into UFO technologies led him to being threatened by an odd-looking man who demonstrated his ability to erase anything and anyone who got too close to the truth. Could it be that those who videoed the entity were threatened and their evidence manipulated to look fake in the eyes of the public? It's definitely plausible. From a religious perspective, 
Leon Melol, leader of the Raelian movement of Israel, a new theological faction who believe extraterrestrials created humans and whose purpose is to extradite Jews from Israel after their leader receives a prophecy, has commented on the video. It's fortunate that these witnesses captured this UFO sighting so that the Israeli public can be more aware of the presence of these extraterrestrials in our sky, said Mr. Mellon who is a devout member and believer of the scriptures detailing aliens and their development of the human species. He goes on to state that they are the aliens of the Bible, they are the scientists who come to earth, thought the light was good and created all forms of life here, including us in their image. The religion was founded and formed in the 1970s by Claude Vorhon in France, at a time when new age religious movements were appearing across the globe, most of which would later become known as cults or a mask for more evil intentions. The teacher of realism center around the belief that an alien race, known as the Elohim, created human beings in their own image, using their creative, progressive technologies. It is said that they created 40 Elohim-human hybrids, whose purpose is to remain a prophet to humanity, and to teach us their origins over the course of time. The prophets, according to scripture, include Jesus Christ, the Great Buddha, the Prophet Muhammad, and Rael himself, as the 40th and final prophet. In preparation for a new world and way of life, followers of Raelianism incorporate meditation, prayer, and purport a strong belief that they will become immortal through the process of human cloning. The arguments surrounding the 2011 UFO video in Jerusalem continue to rage on. However, for some, the discussion of alternative life forms and spiritual descendancy expands well beyond a debatable video clip. When faith, religion, or belief are involved, it is often difficult to find common ground or sway one's opinion to agree with your own. This divide in judgment is healthy to some extent, but unfortunately still leaves the questions unanswered. Are we alone in the universe? What happened to police officer Lonnie Zamora on the early evening of April 24, 1964, will forever be considered an acute sighting of what many consider to be an alien spacecraft. Officer Zamora claims to have witnessed a large, unknown craft which lay dormant in the middle of Socorro, a small town located approximately one hour's drive of Albuquerque in New Mexico. Not only did he witness the craft itself, Zamora also spotted what he believed to be pilots or alien-like entities within the mysterious vessel before it took off into the skies above him. Lonnie Zamora was born on September 7, 1933, in the small village of Magdalena, New Mexico, an area which, according to a 2010 census, has a population of only 938 people. From there, he worked his way up to become a well-respected city of Socorro police officer. It was during his time on the force that something happened around 5.45 p.m. on the evening of April 24, 1964, that would change his life and that of the town forever. On the evening in question, a Friday, the events as recalled by Officer Zamora over the course of time and published in various interview publications occurred as follows. It was a regular day on the job for Zamora. Initially, he had been on the hunt for a speeding car whose driver was heading for the outskirts of the town. When out of the corner of his eye, he noticed what he thought to be an overturned car or motorized vehicle of sorts. Deciding that the priority should center on potential car crash victims, Rather than an overactive boy racer, Sergeant Zamora pulled his cruiser off-road and began to head towards the scene, which was approximately 150 yards from the main stretch of road. As his vehicle bobbed and scraped across the uneven terrain, he began to hear a loud roar emitting from the imperiled car, as well as a large burning flame in the skies above. The rocky road brought him closer to the object as it lay, inoperative, within a dry creek of a large landform in the middle of Socorro. Deciding to park his motor near a section of large bushes and shrubbery, Zamora exited his cruiser and proceeded with caution to what he still, at this point believed to be an overturned, white-colored wagon. During his steady, cautious approach, things would become very clear, very quickly for the young officer, as he would later describe to authorities and reporters of hearing loud thumps or slams which was similar to that of metal hitting metal. Managing to get a better look into the gully that guarded the fallen spacecraft, Zamora got a clear view 
of what was in fact a long, oval-shaped object that the officer described as having girder-like legs and of the structure itself as being like aluminum. It was whitish against the mess of background, but not chrome. With a close vantage point of approximately 50 feet from the object, Zamora also noted that he could see landing gears and a red symbol attached to its construct. Sensing that this was more than just a car crash, and with no sign of people in the vicinity, the lone sergeant tried to ascertain the craft's trajectory, speed, and direction by assessing the grounds and determined that it had been traveling south across Socorro towards an unknown destination. It was at this point that Lonnie would experience his first heart-stopping scare of the incident when he observed what he described as two children or small adults near the vehicle. One of the figures turned around and was startled by his appearance, seeming to jump somewhat at his presence. From there, the two entities came into full view, covered in what seemed to be white coveralls. Despite being rattled by the sudden appearance of the creatures, Zamora came to his senses and quickly headed back to the cruiser to radio the local sheriff's office in order to report the incident and curious nature of what was happening. Passing the message back to base, the shaken officer then contacted the New Mexico State Police and Sergeant Samuel Chavez, a friend of Zamora and someone who he would trust in any situation or with any piece of information. Samuel immediately recognized that his friend and colleague was either in danger or in a state of panic after listening to his frantic call and made immediate preparations to head out and meet his fellow officer at the scene. Zamora, meanwhile, stood in amazement and surprise at what was occurring around him. He had never seen anything like this before. Whilst waiting on the help and support by the NMSP and of Chavez, he began approaching the object once more in the hope of getting a better look and understanding of the structure, as well as trying to make contact with the small people who seemed to be hiding nearby. Suddenly a massive roar erupted from the object and reverberated around the creek as well as the terrified officer. A bluish flame proceeded to burst from the underside of the object, jolting Zamora into a survival mode as he dropped to the ground instinctively in preparation for the egg-shaped sphere's explosion. When the craft refused to detonate, Zamora ran as fast as he could to the other side of the road and hid within the unkept landscape. Peeking out to see what was happening, or about to happen, Zamora heard what seemed to be a propeller-like clamor coming from the ship as it rose from the gully and out of the small area from which it had seemingly crashed. As it hovered, preparing to depart, Lonnie noticed that the beams or legs had now disappeared, as if the landing gears had retreated back into the aerial vessel before it went silent. The flames dissolved as it slowly made its way from the rocky ground and with a burst of speed shot forward and out of sight. By this time, Sergeant Chavez had arrived on the scene and listened to Zamora's testimony as to what had just happened. Both men stood in the spot that had been witness to an unidentified flying object and so began searching for any residual evidence or clues. Together, they noticed burnt bush and plant areas, four angular impressions in the soil where the legs had been, and several small footprints within the ground. This was subsequently reported in the debrief later that day, as both men decided it was time to get out of there and return to base. It was over. In the days and weeks following the event, it was reported by local residents that the site had indeed suffered burn damage and various impressions on the ground that couldn't be explained after they visited the area themselves. From there, newspapers, local media and books were reporting on the incident and attracting interest to the town. No one would know, at the time, that the incident would become a global sensation and considered one of the most intriguing UFO sightings of all time. The most significant investigation into Zamora's claims was conducted by governmental agencies such as the US Air Force's Project Blue Book, who listed the case as unknown. An article was presented within a previously classified CIA publication entitled Studies in Intelligence, which was drafted by Hector Quintanilla Jr., the former head of Project Blue Book, in 1966. Within the dossier, Quintanilla describes the US government's approach to matters concerning UFOs and close encounters of numerous kinds by civilians and military personnel alike. 
With regards to Zamora's account, this was included as the policeman's report, which describes the Socorro incident. Though short in word count and detailed analysis, it certainly shows that top secret communities were taking his claim seriously. A quote from the article states the following, there is no doubt that Lonnie Zamora saw an object which left quite an impression on him. There is also no question about Zamora's reliability. He is puzzled by what he saw, and frankly, so are we. This is the best documented case on record, and still we have been unable, in spite of thorough investigation, to find the vehicle or other stimulus that scared Zamora to the point of panic. The document was approved for release on January 2nd, 1981, and is available to view under the Freedom of Information Act to this very day. From a journalistic perspective, Ray Stanford, the Texas-born author of Socorro Saucer and a Pentagon Party, is a well-respected, well-educated investigator on all things UFO and extraterrestrials, who arrived on the scene within four days of it happening to examine and report on the event. After extensive observation, interviews with Zamora, as well as law enforcement and the general public, Stanford concluded that the story was well worth telling, and through extensive discussions and presentations, brought it to a global audience. Again in 1966, Socorro County Chamber of Commerce President Paul Ridings recommended that the area be sealed off and developed into a tourist attraction site for locals and travellers to visit with hopes of generating income for the town. Alas, yet interestingly, it was proposed that a set of stone walkways be built leading up to the gully from which the entity crashed and resurrected itself into the sky. However, in the end, the commemorative display had to be moved back by a quarter of a mile for fears that the creek was contaminated with radiation. In 2012, Socorro City officials, Ravi Basker and Pat Salome, employed an artist by the name of Erika Burley to paint a mural onto a structural dam in order to commemorate the sighting and to reignite discussion and tourism once more. Unfortunately for Officer Zamora, he never managed to see this painting, as on November 2nd, 2009, he suffered a heart attack and passed away at the age of 76. The media circus and constant requests for interviews and photographs forced Zamora to reassess his lifestyle and residence. He switched careers and was employed as a manager at an external gas station, doing his utmost to keep out of the public eye. Although Lonnie Zamora tried his best to distance himself from the tourists, skeptics and media overhaul, there have been numerous possible explanations as to what happened that day in 1964. Some believe that the apparatus was actually part of a test kit for a lunar landing operation, which was conducted by scientists at the White Sands Missile Range. The facility is a United States Army military testing area and firing range located in New Mexico, with the White Sands National Park located within it. In a 2012 interview, Dave Thomas, president of New Mexicans for Science and Reason, a non-profit organization that promotes scientific examinations to extraordinary claims, wrote and commented on the surrogate theories. The White Sands Missile Range was testing a surveyor. They used a Bell helicopter that was very small. The combination of the lunar craft and the helicopter would have presented an object that looked sort of wide and round. British author and UFO skeptic, Stuart Campbell, has written many books on unexplained events and entities, such as the Loch Ness Monster, as well as extraterrestrials and religious concepts. Campbell, who currently resides in Edinburgh, was awarded a degree in mathematics and science from the Open University in 1983, and is secretary slash treasurer of the Edinburgh Secular Society, so was unsurprisingly confident in presenting his opinion and criticism on the events that took place. When quizzed on the matter, Campbell stated that the vessel was almost certainly a mirage of the star Canopus. But what about the emblem on the side of the structure that Zamora noticed during his ordeal? Despite numerous drawings, paintings and explanations as to what it was or represented, some believe that based on the collage of representations, that it may have been the logo of a Hughes aircraft model from the time. The Hughes Aircraft Company was a large aerospace and defense contractor founded in 1934 by the infamous business magnate Howard Hughes in Glendale, California, 
and may help in deciphering what the craft actually was. With this possibility, the same theory goes for the people seen in the vicinity of the object, which is more described as wearing white coveralls. These entities could in fact have been Project Astronauts, wearing their protective gear during the lunar test operations. What do you think? To witness a UFO in today's technological age is something that many keep to themselves for fear of ridicule, skepticism, or bombardment of alternative explanations and theories. However, for Sergeant Lonnie Zamora, the situation and encounter was so real that he not only reported the incident to his superiors, he wanted, for the best part, to ensure that his story was heard and not misconstrued in any way. Yet, with such a colossal volume of attention and scrutiny, which descended upon the town of Socorro and on Zamora himself. It's no wonder that he wished to disassociate himself and his family from the madness. I guess we can only speculate ourselves on this specific incident and make up our own minds as to whether it really was a UFO or not. So did a well-respected police officer witness a close encounter of the third kind? Were there actually alien life forms visiting New Mexico once again? a mere 17 years after the Roswell incident. Perhaps we all know for sure one day. <laughs>